Um, okay, hi, this is Balkan Devlen, um, Associate Professor at the University of Copenhagen, and uh, this is my third interview with, uh, with scholars working on existential risks uh, for the course Thinking the Unthinkable, Existential Risks, um, and, and, and Black Swans, and all that. Um, uh, today we have Phil Torres, uh, a researcher who has worked uh, on the uh, on this uh, on this quite a while, a very prolific uh, author as well. Um, uh, he is the author um, of of several books, uh, and for our purposes, the uh, the book "Morality: of Foresight and Human Flourishing: An Introduction to Existential Risks" is perhaps the most uh, most relevant one. Uh, I'm so glad uh, you are here, Phil. Um, thanks for thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, so let's 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 start by, by by you know telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you get interested in this uh, X risks issues, and in a, and what do you do right now as well? Yeah. So at the moment, uh, I'm I'm a technically an independent scholar, um, but as I was just mentioning to you, uh, I should be I should have been in Germany uh, in Hanover at the moment, but, um, you know, the EU, uh, borders closed yes. uh, just before I was, I was supposed to leave, uh, which is, is okay. I was quite nervous about getting on a plane, yes. um, given the, the circumstances. Uh, so yeah, so I'm an independent scholar. I, I, uh, publish a fair amount of like academic papers. Also, I do some popular media stuff as well. And, um, Really, for the past uh, eight years or so, my main focus has been on existential risk and global catastrophic risk. Um, so that's a, a t you know, pe people in the field have kind of joked on occasion that there's a kind of job security uh, because <laughs> yes, the, yes, there's been this proliferation yeah. of uh, of of you know global scale threats to to humanity and civilization, um, and that doesn't seem to be going away anytime no. soon, un unfortunately. Um, it's a weird discipline. Ultimately, the, the point of the discipline is for there to be no need for the discipline. You know, so we're, we're trying to get, <laughs> yes. make it the case that there's, there's no need for professionals. Um, but uh, yeah, so, um, so existential risk has really been my focus for a long time. And I, I guess I got into it uh, because um, it, it was probably, you know, around 2005, I became quite interested in transhumanism and initially was very critical of, uh, of this view. Uh, my, my sort of default um, uh, ideological position when it comes to these uh, the issues relating to transhumanism by conservative design was, was anarcho-primitivism. Mm -hmm, Anything mm -hmm. sort of returned to, to nature. And then I, I became convinced that um, the, the march of, uh, you know, the, the process of technologization, of te technological development, uh, and so on is inexorable. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just not a um, practicable goal to bring, you know, this, this whole enterprise, um, th this juggernaut to a halt. Uh, but instead, what we need to do is try to figure out ways of, of, um, of altering the trajectory of civilizational development moving forward in ways that are uh, more optimal. So, you know, and before that, I mean, I, I grew up in a quite religious household in mm -hmm. which, um, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of a Baptist uh, mm -hmm. community and uh, the particular theological interpretation they adopted was called dispensationalism. Okay. And when you hear that term, you should think rapture. Yes. Uh, rapture Left is, behind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Left Behind series, yeah. which have sold more than I think Stephen uh, um, King. And yes, yes. Grisham like together, yeah. It, it's, yeah. And so, so ever since basically the nineteen seventies, that's been hugely popular in yeah. the United States. And uh, yeah, so there was a lot of talk about uh, the Antichrist and uh, rapture, and and the talk of other eschatological you know, yes. times themes. Uh, so I think I think that um, piqued my curiosity <laughs> in long term uh, future of humanity type issues and, mm -hmm. and then as i as i uh, you know apostatized later on um, uh, uh, and therefore did not you know view these topics through the prism of, of religious uh, belief then um, uh, i was pl i was uh, happy to see that there's this uh, new emerging field that was sort of uh, looking t um, looking seriously at these topics from a scientific perspective. 
Um, and yeah, not only is the topic going to be increasingly uh, germane moving mm -hmm. forward, but um, but I think it, it you know it matters a, a lot. We really are kind of in this qualitative, at least in my judgment, we're in this kind of qualitatively new uh, epoch um, in which human extinction is is possible. Um, we we can bring about our own extinction, <laughs> um, and you know if if we couldn't, then if we wait long enough, you know an asteroid or a super volcano or something is going to is going to get us, and that's just going to result in a huge amount of human suffering. It's a very very in yeah. essence a very critical juncture right now, and I think we're going to mm -hmm. get onto that later on, um, mm -hmm. and particularly when we sort of perhaps talk about later on on your on your uh, agent tool coupling issues mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that we are bringing in additional novel. Um, you know, risks that did not exist before that, that by definition did not happen, mm -hmm. uh, unlike sort of nature-based ones like, you know, comet strikes or asteroids or super volcanoes, which we can yeah. have some sense of base rate of how these things, how often they happen and so on and so forth because they're a natural phenomenon. But yeah. now that we are bringing in these other, you know, capabilities uh, yeah. that we never had before, and there was no sort of known, uh, you know, the, the whole survivorship bias issue, um, mm -hmm. that, 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 so it's very hard to get, get, a, get a handle on that. Um, maybe, you know, sort of using this as a segue to get into sort of the, another thing I really want to ask you. Um, given, given, the, given this particular circumstances, which, which existential risks concerns you the most, um, most today? Um, so it's kind of a difficult question to answer because there are different types of, uh, they're like kind of fundamentally different types of risks. So like climate change is this kind of slow motion um, uh, risk that's happening in real time and we're kind of still in the inchoate phases of it. Um, and, you know, really within the next, uh, you, know, you know, handful of uh, decades, we will be, uh, suffering um, immensely as a result of yes. mega droughts, extreme weather events, more infectious disease, uh, and so on. So I, I feel like, um, and my sense is that uh, climate, since, since uh, climate change is kind of a, a risk that frames our entire uh, predicament. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we don't, you know, it, it's often referred to as a, a threat multiplier and threat yes. intensifier. So it's going to introduce new threats and also make you know currently existing threats even worse. Uh, so therefore, it could you know could elevate the probability that there's a nuclear conflict. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just mentioned infectious diseases that could get worse. Uh, you know, there's something called zombie pathogens. Uh, yes. These yeah pathogens up in permafrost that have yes. just been you know. Uh, Not around for like several hundreds, thousands of years, and you come back. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Just in suspended animation for yeah. like huge amount of time. So, um, so I feel like there is an argument to be made um, that I find fairly convincing that climate change uh, and and global biodiversity loss as well. I mean, we're in the early stages of the sixth mass extinction event. Yes, and uh, um, you know, and, and there's I, I think I mentioned this in the book that there, there's you know some. Uh, talk among reputable scientists of the possibility of like a state shift in terms mm -hmm. of a global, a global ecosystem that could occur quite rapidly and pretty much just change uh, in in really significant ways um, the uh, uh, the conditions of uh, of of Earth, the conditions of the, the state of the biosphere. Um, so I so those I feel like are quite urgent and will just exacerbate everything else. Otherwise, I feel like in the in terms of um, ri uh, probably the most uh, significant long term threat, I think is machine superintelligence. Mm -hmm. And you know, to it, it's there are good arguments. They, they could be wrong. Uh, more, you know, re research is still in uh, is still really quite um, incipient at this point. But it seems like right now it's reasonable to conclude that uh, greater than human level uh, machine uh, superintelligence uh, or artificial intelligence um, really could pose like ex you know, extraordinary um, risks to humanity. It's probably an all or nothing kind of phenomenon. If it, things don't turn out, you know, Stephen Hawking and Nick Bostrom and various others have made this argument. Um, if, it, if things don't turn out very well, they'll turn out um, catastrophic. Horribly wrong, yeah, exactly. Horribly wrong. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I think in the longer term, uh, you know, we need to solve the, the value alignment problem 
and figure out how to, one, just put our values into uh, you know, uh, the programming language, and two, figure out what our values are. And that may entail solving some perennial philosophical issues that have been the source of immense uh, de debate and controversy since the pre-Socratics. <laughs> you know, so exactly. so it, it's, it seems like a really uh, formidable, it se that's to me seems like the most formidable challenge uh, facing us. And a lot of the other risks, like we sort of know um, exactly what to do mm -hmm. to mitigate them. Like we know how to solve climate change, uh, global biodiversity loss and so on. Maybe the one exception along with superintelligence is, is super volcanoes. Mm -hmm. And there just really aren't, e e some people have noted, even within science fiction, there aren't really any good suggestions. NASA's talked about perhaps pumping, you know, co co cooled, uh, cool water into the magma chamber. Um, but that's just a really preliminary yeah. suggestion. And some people have said, if that were to be, uh, if that uh, um, technique were to be implemented, there's a chance it could trigger uh, super volcanic eruption, which would be, you know, pretty bad. Yes. So, even yeah. with asteroids, we know what we can at least theoretically do, right? I mean, send these yeah. nukes and then is hopefully, you know, change their trajectories and stuff like that and, and can deal mm -hmm. with them. But with, yeah, exactly, with, with super volcanoes, how are you? You know, you can't really, you know, stuck a, 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 something on top of them and then prevent from them. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, right now it's <laughs> all about, it's just about adaptation. Yes. You know, it's about bunkers and, you know, uh, Martian colonies and stuff like that. Yeah. So there's no real mitigation or, you know, any good strategies to obviate uh, super yeah. you know, corruption from occurring. Yeah, definitely. I mean, which, which um, again, I think thinking about how to mitigate also helps us to sort of uh, segue to another sort of interesting mm -hmm. question, and that is how to study these things. I mean, um, yes, some of them, like we talked before, have some level of base rates that we can rely on, some statistical methods and techniques that we have and could deal with, but mm -hmm. others are are novel and by by definition, you know, we did not have any any other existential uh, risk event that happened that wiped out humanity because we are around. Um, so you know how to study these things and mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in a rigorous way um, to how, how can we what, what methods and ways of, of thinking you find are most uh, fruitful yeah it's a it's a great question um, and it's worth emphasizing that the field is fledgling it's really young and some of these um, uh, the, 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 the proposed answers to this question that um, have yet to be really worked through and, mm -hmm. and really discussed um, in detail and with sophistication uh, among scholars. So the, it's early days. And, and therefore, you know, uh, with respect to um, students, there is so much opportunity yes. for young people with uh, new ideas. You know, Thomas Kuhn's famously noted that a lot of scientific revolutions come about as a result of young people or people who are outside of a field coming in because they, they are able to look at a problem uh, you know, from perspectives that um, haven't been determined by the knowledge, you know, by, by the various paradigms that uh, um, are dominant in the field. So, you know, so there's, it's an exciting uh, time to, to be a young person um, interested in these topics. And so, I, I mean, as you mentioned, on the one hand, there, there's, there is some objective data about, like, you know, the, the rate of... Um, uh, you know, 10 kilometer asteroids or comets uh, striking Earth, and uh, as well as you know, super volcanic eruptions. We know that like every mm -hmm. you know, 50,000 years on average, there's super volcanic eruption. And uh, there hasn't been um, for, uh, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, mm. but something like 40,000 years. And of course the Toba catastrophe, which is like really well known and might have resulted in this huge population yeah. bottleneck that was 75,000 years ago, more or less. Um, so, but then you, but you're totally right. So one thing that, um, uh, conceptual distinction that I find useful is like existing threats and emerging threats. Mm -hmm. and emerging threats have a lot to do with, um, are bound up uh, uh, quite a bit with emerging technologies, synthetic biology, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology, um, artificial intelligence, ge geoengineering, things uh, of that nature. And um, so it, it is, it's difficult to um, really understand the, uh, uh, 
the potential risks associated with, with some of these technologies. I feel like the, the current pandemic, there's a, there's a troubling sense in which it's kind of a proof of concept um, mm -hmm. for you know, some homicidal agent who's interested in using um, you know, synthetic biology to synthesize a designer pathogen and um, try to spread it around the globe. Uh, so it, 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 makes, it, makes it, it makes that possibility a bit more vivid. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I, I think one thing that has been discussed quite a bit in the literature uh, and, and pertains uh, directly to the question is cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. so, so one way to go about studying these is to understand what the cognitive biases are that can distort clear thinking about these extraordinarily complex uh, uh, problems facing us, um, completely you know, unprecedented in, in a, um, human history. You know, which goes back 300,000 years. Uh, so, you know, things like, like hindsight bias, um, you know, we tend to think, if we can recall a, a similar situation in the past, we tend to think that uh, a situation of that kind um, is more likely in the future, as opposed to something completely novel, like an AI takeover, which mm -hmm. sounds uh, to the um, untrained ear, uh, as, as it pr maybe should, it sounds quite absurd. Mm -hmm. ridiculous there's there's not there's no uh historical example from which we can extrapolate um but uh but then again it's good to re remind oneself that uh science is full of completely counterintuitive uh, yes you know ideas like you know the germ theory yes. uh, relativity and so on and so on it's a very you know most of science that's they say most of physics is is uh is it's more unlearning than learning yeah, I mean, like, so, I think it was Niels Bohr who said it, right? If you think you understand quantum mechanics, you actually don't understand quantum mechanics. Uh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. In that sense, it is, it is not intuitive to think about these tail risks. Uh, yeah. I think that's, you know, for, for the majority of the human, uh, human beings, because that, that's really the whole idea is, is that they are, they are so un, uncommon and rare, but the exponential consequences are not, um, yeah, is is, is 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 just beyond what people can actually focus on, and of course, yeah. there's a whole cognitive um, tension in the sense mm -hmm. that it is a lot of uh, cognitive load to be able mm -hmm. to think in, and be concerned about these very sort of tail risks, while at the same time maintaining um, you know, focus or attention to various other short-term or, or or immediate immediate problems. So human beings tend to sort of don't deal with uncertainty very well, and this is an area in which there is very deep uncertainty, um, and that's that's cognitively um, you know uncomfortable. Um, yeah. And and for the majority, again, also I think emotionally uncomfortable to deal yeah. with, and and that creates anxiety and stuff. So we're actually horrible in dealing with those things uh, overall, and that that presents a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, yeah, there was a German philosopher who talked about um, uh, what he called uh, apocalyptic blindness. And mm -hmm. it's just sort of this uh, refusal to acknowledge uh, the possibility of, um, of our extinction. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, very, uh, various other scholars have uh, made similar points. H.G. Wells, mm -hmm. um, who's sort of the founder of, of future studies with this 1901 uh, book of his. Um, but yeah, he's... he's uh, um, I think it was in his, in his article, The Extinction of Man, mm -hmm. uh, where he begins by saying, you know, it's, it seems outrageous uh, to us that the, you know, the universe could exist without uh, uh, humanity. But, you know, many times in the past, there have been species, uh, speaking loosely, who have, who have had a similar thought, uh, you know, a world without, without us, and then, you know, 99.9% .9 of them have uh, died out. So, yeah, uh, apocalyptic blindness is definitely one. I mean, there's like observation selection effects, mm -hmm. uh, which um, are, you know, have really only recently uh, been uh, discussed in any like philosophical detail. John Wesley, um, in his 1996 book, The End of the World, uh, I think he provided some of the first um, like really serious uh, discussion of it. And then obviously Nick Bostrom has, has taken mm -hmm. that up a bit. And so that, you know, that affects, um, uh, how we understand our existential predicament when we retrospect through history and uh, and we see you know uh, in absence of global catastrophes that have resulted in our extinction um, and yeah so consequently we, we could end up uh, becoming more confident than we ought to be mm -hmm. that uh, the future is safe um, 
So yeah, it, it is, um, I mean, one of the things about existential risk studies is it, it's a wildly interdisciplinary field. And so there, there um, are kind of, a, you know, somewhat established methodologies in um, contiguous fields. You mm -hmm. know, technology studies, you know, people do technology forecasting. Um, uh, you know, obviously there are like epidemiologists mm -hmm. out there and, um, who, who work on the, the spread of pathogens through populations. So existential risk is sort of drawing from a lot of these different fields and trying to cobble together a robust, um, you know, and scientific uh, way of thinking about these issues. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge to, to, to think, clear, to think uh, clearly about um, events that have never happened before. It might not, not ever happen, but also they might. Yeah, I mean, um, what what would you say? Would you said before in terms of this 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 field provides a lot of opportunity for young people who want to think about these these issues. What would your suggestion be to some? This course is mostly for um, uh, most of our students are master's students um, in the uh, security risk management master's program mm -hmm. in, in University of Copenhagen. But also we have uh, students from political science uh, master's program as well. So they are they are they are graduate level students. Um, what is the one or two two tools that you think you know uh the students sort of tool themselves up in, in terms of develop their capabilities or skills um mm -hmm. if they want to work on this um uh later on what would you suggest them to go and learn and and and, and polish up yeah um so i, I think on the, on the one hand th th there's been some discussion about um broad versus targeted strategies for okay. existential risk mitigation uh, so the the targeted strategy, you know, if your target strategy is focused spe on specific um, uh, hazards, so this would be like you know uh, engineered pandemic or um, uh, you know uh, stratospheric geoengineering gone wrong, and so in so in that case, I think you can just kind of specialize, mm -hmm. um, and you could become an epidemiologist or a computer scientist or something like that. Uh, but there are also these sort of broad um, uh, strategies which is really just trying to, to understand the, the possible like um, path dependency. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a path dependency is like, you know, there's some event that occurs early on and it determines the space of possibility moving forward. The QWERTY keyboard is like a, a famous example. It's, there's just so much inertia, even yeah. though it's the, the layout for, for the, you know, I'm in the U.S. Uh, so the, yeah. you know, the layout for the keyboard, it's, it's really inefficient. Yeah, there are yeah, a lot of keys yeah. you, you type a lot that you have to reach for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but at this point, it's just incredibly difficult to, to change that. So there could be similar um, kind of a path dependencies that have uh, you know, pretty suboptimal uh, outcomes. So trying to understand um, that, that, that requires a more, I think, kind of generalist mm -hmm. approach. And um, so I've, I've been a fan of um, a guy named uh, Wilfred Sellers, a uh, philosopher. Okay. And he was a pragmatist, and, mm -hmm. um, but he proposed this very famous, like, metaphilosophical view, uh, whereby he says, you know, f philosophy is um, an attempt to understand how things, in the broadest sense, hang together in the broadest sense. So, in other words, yeah. he's saying, you know, philosophers are reflective generalists. Yeah. And so, I do think a, a, a background um, in philosophy is is mm -hmm. useful, um, or, or just you know, autodidactically studying. Uh, yep. Uh, philosophy on your, on your own uh, is is quite useful for just kind of getting uh, um, for for uh, cultivating a the capacity to uh, see things in a sort of big picture way. Um, but also, it's perhaps worth noting I've I've written about this for a while, and and I've actually been. Uh, evangelizing for this idea mm -hmm. without a whole lot of luck, but I, you know, there, there's a kind of breadth depth trade off. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, given finite uh, brain energy, memory capacity, uh, and time during the day, you know, the, the deeper your knowledge on something, the you have to sacrifice some, some breadth as well. Uh, so, you know, there's just no more, uh, th there's no such thing as a polymath anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just dilettante. No, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and that, but that's past, sad. And that's, that's quite sad, actually. I think we are losing a lot because of that, I guess. But that's, a, I think, a completely so, different um, debate. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally, I, I think it's, it's just our epistemic situation. Yes. And it's a crisis. Uh, so in terms of like what to, to know, like mm -hmm. one of the, the things that, uh, uh, one of the challenges to answering that question is that because existential risk studies is so 
uh, interdisciplinary. Um, it's you're sort of forced to choose between between getting like a broad understanding of all of the various you know uh, the, the mechanics of the issue, all how all the gears fit together and the uh -huh. springs and you know whatever, and then sort of specializing uh, uh, in one particular topic. So it, it's a it's a challenge to uh, to do this work yes. well. Yes. Um, yes. Everybody in the everybody I talk to says it's you know it's really difficult to. Uh, in other words, the stuff you need to know uh, uh, goes f extends far beyond your innate ability to yes. know. Yes. Um, given those finite uh, resources, yes. so you're, everybody's kind of flailing around in a dark room looking for the light yes. switch. Yes. <laughs> and it doesn't bode it, like super well for no. you know no. our situation, but. You know that's the, the predicament. But, I mean, one thing is is is, is precisely the, what would you said. This is a very sort of young field that is emerging. And I think as we sort of mature, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as as the time goes, the, there will be some level of balance between those who specialized uh, mm -hmm. on specific things, and then then those more bigger picture um, uh, researchers that try to sort of combine them. And if you want to go with the sort of bigger picture, at least from what I can see and read and and. and thinking about these things uh, more sort of professionally as well. I mean, my, my own research tends to be more on decision making and foreign policy and stuff, but I always had the, you know, since I read the, you know, uh, Bostrom's uh, book back in 2010, I uh, was much more interested in it and, and always kept going back to, to these and this, this provide a good opportunity to, to read more and, and teach this. Um, yeah. But what I really find is, is kind of useful is sort of, would you say one, one is, is philosophy. So basically about thinking about how to think um, seems to be quite helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Having some, you know, mathematical understanding um, is, 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 is useful. I mean, people don't need to get be, 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 be mathematicians to be able to do that, but have a sense of how probabilities work, how the numbers feel a bit comfortable about the mathematical aspects of how to think about these things, get, you know, exponentials and power laws and, and stuff like that, as well as I think, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, creative and speculative fiction. Um, is, is a useful way of because you don't need to think the whole idea of, of, of mental gymnastics and, and scenarios and, and, and planning and, and trying to think the unthinkable. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of sort of speculative fiction and, and, and you don't need to be a science fiction writer, but I think you can draw a lot on how people think about the future and uncertainty from those. And, and, yeah. and if you can sort of branch out to these, these things, that, that should help uh, quite a bit. I completely agree. I, math is really important. Probability theory yes. is, is important. Um, decision theory yes. has, you know, it has a kind of prominent role uh, um, in the field uh, for, for good reason. And also, I, I very much concur about the uh, science fiction. So I, like, I've been working on a, a book um, about the history of the, of the naturalistic idea of human extinction. Okay. When did it emerge? You know, when did it take shape? When did it become... Um, taken seriously mm -hmm. by scientists and philosophers, and uh, and without a doubt, uh, you know, science fiction has played a really important uh, role. It's been an incubator for all sorts of of important ideas, and uh, I, I I myself am a latecomer to science yeah. fiction. I do, uh, unlike a lot of colleagues who grew mm -hmm. up uh, mm -hmm. reading, you know, H.G. Wells and uh, yes. Flammarion and you know. Uh, yeah and Stapledon and so on. Um, I, I only read them the past, you know, two years or so, but okay. it's, it's um, uh, definitely um, the, like you said, the, the sort of mental um, gymnastics uh, is, um, uh, is you, one can learn a lot in terms yeah. of like scenario um, uh, analysis mm -hmm. in terms of devising, you know, uh, different plausible ways that the, uh, you know, the courses of civilizational mm -hmm. development moving mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. um, it is really useful to have some understanding of yeah. science fiction and just to, to adopt those, that sort of mode of creative thinking um, is, yeah, that, that can be super useful. No, For definitely, sure. definitely. I mean, yeah. I think this, this is, in that sense, is very sort of exciting um, time to, to, um, to work on these things, um, mm -hmm. which which I want to sort of uh, branch out towards maybe wrapping up to the last sort of section, and a lot of people are having these things in mind. And I want to try to keep these things, you know, manageable size so that the so people actually listen to them. Um, yeah. 
what, what, what can we, what can the study of existential and global catastrophic risks tell us about the current COVID pandemic in the sense that, you know, it is, this is not an existential risk. I mean, whatever, even in the worst case sort of scenarios that we can, we can formulate, maybe it might reach to the level of, you know, catastrophic risk but mm -hmm. definitely not an existential risk at this at this stage or the yeah. way we, we think about it but study of these things could tell us how to think and, and and respond to to similar pandemics so what 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 can we learn about what we studied um to 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 to, to let us know uh, about sort of the trajectory of this uh, of this pandemic yeah um this is kind of an amazing moment uh, to be thinking about these issues. Um, obviously, there, there ha uh, for the following reasons, um, mm -hmm. you know, there have been uh, obviously qu quite a number of global pandemics in the yeah. past, yeah. Black Death, um, Plague of Justinian, and so on. Um, and, of and of course, the 1918 to 1920 Spanish flu outbreak. Um, but, uh, but, you know, all of those occurred in quite different um, technological societal contexts uh, or milieus. And so it's, it's um, I think there's a lot to, there's a lot of uncertainty. I know that that's, that's been a bit dramatic uh, in the discussion for good reason, because it, it's, yeah. Um, so uh, how this is going to unfold in a globalized world uh, with global trade and, you know, an economic system that is, uh, uh, spans from one corner of the, of the world to the other um, is, is a bit un clear right now. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, lessons learned from this that will then be able to um, enhance uh, um, scholarship thinking about like, uh, you know, an asteroid impact or, you know, a, a nuclear uh, um, conflict of some sort. And uh, it's, it's sort of unfortunate that, you know, I just recently uh, with, a, with a colleague of mine, I wrote like a history of existential risk studies you know, mm -hmm. from 2002 when Boston published his paper up to yeah. the present. And there's kind of been like three paradigms that have emerged. One is the, the Bostromian paradigm. Yeah. Uh, and then two is, the, is a deeply um, connected paradigm, which is long-termism mm -hmm. associated with the effect of altruism movement. But then more recently, especially since 2018, when there was a flurry of papers, so probably 10, 12 papers, um, looking at existential risk from a more systems theoretic perspective. Mm. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, in the, in the past, like in Bostrom's paper, uh, you know, he talks about like these very isolated single kind of narratives. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Greg who? That's one narrative. AI. That's, um, and um, the alternative view is to, is to try to think about how, uh, to think about the systematicity of these risks. How is the case that um, uh, you know, I'd mentioned climate change earlier, like that may have, that may modulate the level of risk um, with respect to, uh, you know, emerging technologies or nuclear weapons or something. Um, so, so un my point is that unfortunately, this literature on um, sort of uh, systemic risk mm -hmm. is, is pretty nascent right now. It's, yes. it's pretty new. And uh, it's exactly the kind of literature, it's exactly the kind of research focus that would be really pertinent. Mm -hmm. uh, that is really mm -hmm. pertinent right now. And unfortunately, it just hasn't, it hasn't um, matured. There's, there's one paper um, called Governing Boring Apocalypses, which is really good. And they talk about these, they have this kind of tripartite framework where they talk about hazards, which is what pre, um, previous work within existential risk studies had focused on. It's just that initial shock, that exogenous, mm -hmm factor that's you know it's an asteroid that hits or it's a super volcano that explodes um and uh uh so they talk about you've got the hazards on the other hand you've got these vulnerabilities and then exposures hmm. and they, they talk about like historically um you know the, the literature on like civilization collapse suggests that uh you know it, it has at times only taken a pretty minor definitely sub existential uh, shock mm -hmm. to initiate this cascade Shade, yeah. of effects where there, you know, there's positive feedback effects and, you know, tipping points. So, you know, things just kind of get worse and worse linearly, but then as soon as you cross this threshold, suddenly everything goes. Uh, so um, the pandemic right now is, uh, is, is worrisome, not just because of the 
number of individuals it would directly mm -hmm. um, kill, which I, I think, you know, I'm here in the US and I'm, I'm pretty yeah. <laughs> scared. Yeah, <laughs> um, I can imagine. The, the next month is just gonna be uh, uh, pretty bad. Um, but also like, what are the ramifications? What, what are the, the, you know, the, the ripple effects? Mm -hmm. um, how is it gonna, in, you know, if people panic, uh, and they don't want to go to work. Um, and, and as a result, there's like certain fundamental aspects of our infrastructure, like yeah. water and, you know, electricity and so on that start to fail. Um, how could that then cascade uh, further to increase the chance of um, a nuclear conflict or, you know, mm -hmm, a, state, mm -hmm. a, a state collapsing and, you know, some uh, terrorists going in and stealing nuclear weapons or something. Uh, so we kind of don't really... No. Yeah, yeah. Right now. I mean, this, this, it's an extra, it's, um, so, I mean, if you just bracket all, all of the, like, um, the, the immense, you know, unfathomable sadness of the situation. Um, <laughs> so yeah. if, you, if you can bracket yeah. all that, there's also a great opportunity here to learn about yeah. the systematicity of, yes. um, of risks. Yeah. But yeah, otherwise, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've talked to a bunch of colleagues and a lot of them are like, just don't have a good sense of yeah. somehow are somewhat pessimistic yeah. about how things will, will turn out and say, yeah, there's a mm -hmm. non-trivial chance, you know, we'll be, uh, you know, catapulted back to something like the Pleistocene, you know, so yeah. they say it will collapse or something. Um, others are, are, you know, a bit more sanguine about, uh, about what's going to happen, but, um, yeah, this is, there'll be a, you know, maybe there's going to be an explosion of, uh, of uh, research papers uh, yeah. because of this uh, situation. I mean, I, I always find it to think the risks is, you know, forming a matrix rather than, you know, isolated cases and, and sort of understanding the relations between that matrix and, and perhaps even sort of a... Um, a, a, a degrees of, of changing colors, you know, in a sense, yeah. how things work and how they can, they, they clearly is all these dominoes and, and lead to, you know, how, how we can move from a small personal risk to sort of the whole idea of going to pun generational and, and, and the whole terminal level yeah. and how those dominoes could start falling. And I always yeah. find that, 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 that level of thinking is, is much more useful rather than isolating. And I think the second thing perhaps yeah. is, um, I, I I could foresee a, a more sort of cross pollination between um, sort of existential risk literature and people working on that, together with with people working on on complex systems and and tail risks like you know people like uh, you know Nassim Taleb you know whatever you think about his sort of <laughs> uh, to persona um, has been you know talking about yeah. these tail risks and the consequences and and what to do about it and yeah. others you know, Banir Bariam and others. Who are um, who are highlighting those connections, and I think we, uh, within the existential risk sort of community, could actually benefit from some of that thinking. Because the, one of the sort of fundamental messages that 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 the Taleb keeps giving, and I sort of agree with him there, is that the probability of something you cannot necessarily change that, but you can change the consequence or the function of that. You can change yeah. the payoff, he, as he keeps saying. So. Yeah. Um, uh, then, then we can, you know, he says, we might not know what will be the, uh, you, know, you don't know what to do. You, you cannot, you know, you cannot know what it's going to happen. It's deep into uncertainty, but it actually makes your job of what to do now much easier because there are only limited options of how to avoid the worst and all that kind of thing. And I think we should be able to bring those thinking more, more, more clearly into this, into this uh, debate yeah. in the literature. I totally agree. And it suggests that, you know, the, um, the field, sh the focus of the field should not just be um, scientific no. in like, like, how is it, for example, you built, you, um, uh, um, you know, what is the, what is the optimal design for spacecraft that's going to go up and deflect an incoming a mm -hmm. asteroid away from earth, but also there's a governance issue yeah. that's really crucial. And that's the kind of vulnerability, you know, it, yeah. it could be the case that, um, well, I mean, he, 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 the pandemic right now in the U.S. is a great example because we are very vulnerable. We don't need to be. Yes. You know, there were, there were things we could have done if we had better governance yes. um, to have uh, ensured that, uh, you know, far fewer people are going to get sick and far fewer people are going are to die um, a, a horrific, um, you know, suffocation death. Um, yes. 
So it, it's so I, I I think that's a really important mm-hmm, mm-hmm. point. It's uh, and I completely agree with the Nesson Tyler about about that. Sometimes yeah. you can't change the probability, but you can change the response, and that's just as crucial as exactly. Um, yeah, as, as obviating the, as neutralizing the hazard to begin with. Yeah, I mean, bringing yeah. the human component at the center in that sense, both in terms of the multiplication of the risks, but also the mitigation of the risks. And a mm-hmm. lot of these are, uh, would be sort of independent of the technological or scientific development, but a lot mm-hmm. of it should be filtered through actual humans doing the job and doing the governance. And that requires a lot of institutions and so, and so forth. And, and, and bringing that, and in the focus, I think, is, is fundamentally important to yeah. do that. And, um, and it also seems like th- this is a um, this particular um, incident that's unfolding right now will facilitate a further integration of like systems theory yes. thinking within existential risk studies, as well as you know the paper I mentioned to you governing boring apocalypses. Um, they draw from like disaster studies. I mean, that's a whole field. Yes. Um, but there's almost kind of no can, there's no you mentioned cross-pollination. There's almost no like, you know, converse, uh, a, di- a dialogue that's um, occurring between disaster study scholars and existential risk scholars. Um, and yeah, and I think the simplism of the, the early literature is perfectly excusable because it, yes. it, was, it was just starting out and you have to, you know, you, you have to build on, you can't just begin with like this really sophisticated, no. uh, complex, uh, elaborate um, theoretical uh, apparatus. Um, because it, it, it's too difficult for people to people need to ease into ideas. So, um, yeah. So I, I I don't blame that. For, but it, it, fortunately, the field is developing at such a pace uh, and in such a direction that we are th- thinking more and more about the the uh, complexities of these risks. And you know, yeah. And I I think uh, you know I, I I'm happy with this uh, current uh, trajectory of of uh, scholarship yeah definitely yeah. well uh this has been a very nice and a, and a great conversation thank you so much uh for for making the time and 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 joining us here today thanks a lot phil yeah thanks a lot thanks for having me